Uh, so Maggie Berthium, as I mentioned last night, is the uh, the director of debate at Woodward Academy here in Atlanta, and she is going to start guiding you through this year's debate topic. Yay! <laughs> Good morning, y'all. Um, I said this for a few of you, but you might not have been in here yet. Um, there is a note to outline that goes with the document or goes with the lecture. You are welcome to use it or not use it at your leisure. Um, if you are a paper note taker, you will be just fine. You did, there's nothing like secret in the notes document. Um, but if you are a computer notes taker, it might just help you um, keep organized and, and figure out where we are um, in the lecture. So you can go ahead and download that. Um, that is will take you to a Google Doc. If you press download, it will download as a verbatim doc. So if you're a Microsoft Word user, um, it will download as a verbatim doc. If you are a Google Docs person, um, you can just make a copy, and then you'll have your own Google Doc. All right, good morning, y'all. Um, happy first day of the ending. We're really glad you're here. Um, here's sort of what we're going to be doing this morning. Um, we're going to be talking about the resolution. We're going to be talking a little bit about economic inequality. We're going to be then delving into some key concepts in the resolution, some detailed concepts in the resolution. And then there will be a specific Q&A time at the end. But I do want to emphasize that if you have a question as we're going, just raise your hand. Um, so that I see you, um, and you can ask your question anytime. If that becomes like awkward or disruptive, I'll you know we'll we'll um, adjust then. But for now, um, if you have a question, feel free to ask your question. Feel comfortable asking a question anytime. <coughs> so uh, I sort of think I I, uh, I really like giving topic lectures, and I also sort of think topic lectures shouldn't exist. And the reason for that is because um, the cool thing about policy debate is that you get to learn about a topic for an entire year. And so I'm giving you a topic lecture today, you know, on the uh, 5th of June. Um, and you're going to be learning about this topic, for some of you, all the way through April. Um, and so to say that this is the one topic lecture, or this is like the set of things that you should know, is very silly. Um, all of us, meaning all of us as students, all of us as learners, all of us as teachers, are just starting to learn about the topic. And so the topic lecture that I give today is probably different than the topic lecture that I give on Friday after I hear you all debate a little bit. And it's definitely different than the topic lecture I give in you know, October or December. But this is a good start on learning some details about what we're going to be debating about this year. Um, and it will give you um, a sort of overview of why we're here um, and what we're debating about. So the resolution is uh, what we are debating about this year. So, for those of you who haven't debated policy debate before, um, policy debate has a single resolution um, that everyone who does policy debate, I would say nationwide, but it's really worldwide now, everyone that does policy debate debates the same thing for an entire season. Um, and the reason we do that is because it allows you to delve very deeply into a subject um, over the course of time and learn a lot about something. So um, the resolution tends to be relatively broad um, to give you opportunities to learn not just for a short amount of time, but for a long amount of time. So this is what we will be debating about um, all year for those of you who debate um, policy debate. So this is our resolution, um, and I did include it in the notes document. If you are taking notes on paper, I don't think you need to write the whole thing down right now. Don't panic about that. Um, you can just like copy paste it later. Um, but this is the resolution. Resolutions almost always start with the word resolved, um, and that comes from resolutions in Congress. Uh, and then the idea is that um, the, the, uh, one of the teams, the affirmative team, is going to propose something that the federal government should do to substantially increase fiscal redistribution in the United States. And they should do that by adopting a federal jobs guarantee, expanding Social Security, and or providing a basic income. And that is what we will be debating the whole year. Um, and it might sound like that's not enough to debate for a whole year, but it's actually probably enough to debate for you know, almost a whole lifetime. Um, that these debates are, are very detailed, um, and they're very exciting, and there's lots of people who spend their whole life doing this. So I'm going to give you a little background on economic inequality, um, focusing on the United States, because that's where uh, the resolution is taking place. Hey, y'all, come on in. Don't stress. So, economic inequality, at its foundation, is unequal distribution of income and or wealth throughout a population. It means that some people have more stuff than other people have. Some people have more, some people have less, and that's economic inequality. Does anybody know the difference between income and wealth? Income and wealth. Take a run at it. Yeah, what's your name? Pierce. Pierce, give it a try. Income is, is, is how much money or uh, 
or how, how much fiscal uh, what value you're, you're making each year over time, mm -hmm. and relative to what you currently have. It's the same thing you have in Florida. Yeah, there's, there, you're on to something there. So one of them is about you know how much you are making, how much you are taking in each year. If I said my income is X dollars, that means how much money I'm making every year. And wealth does have to do with something about how much you have. There's another component that I want to I wanna add to it. Um, to let you. Um, so like with wealth, sometimes it can just be coming from your parents. So if someone doesn't work hard, they just already have like an advantage. But if someone does want to work hard, but they don't have as much wealth from their parents, then they can't like uh, get as far as the person from wealthy parents. Yes. Okay. So income is earnings, as Pierce said, the amount you make from your job or your cell phone business. It also includes interest on savings and investments. So if you invest in the stock market and you get interest from those investments, that is included in your income. And payments from social programs. If you um, get, uh, you know, if you get uh, payments from a social program that pays you money, um, that is included in income. Wealth, which is sometimes known as net worth, Kalechi's on to something, which is that wealth can be inherited. And Pierce is on to something, which is that it's the value of all the stuff you have. So it's the value of all of your assets minus your debt. So the easiest way to think about this is if your family owns a house, for example, um, that house is part of your wealth, but it's not part of your income, right? You didn't, you didn't like get given a house usually, um, except under some special circumstances. Um, but usually a house is something um, that you would purchase and then the value of that house um, is part of your wealth. And Kalechi's right, wealth can be inherited. Income can't be inherited, right? Your, your parents' income, if you're, you know, or your grandparents or your great-grandparents, if they were to die, they can pass along wealth, but they're not passing along their income. You're not getting, you're not like stealing their job from them. Um, and income inequality can be either unequal distribution, unequal distribution of income or wealth. And so sometimes we talk about income, or sometimes we talk about economic inequality, we're talking about income, sometimes we're talking about wealth, sometimes we're talking about both. All right, I think you're going to get this, but I want, I want somebody new. Why is wealth inequality in a society typically greater than income inequality? Why might wealth inequality be greater than income inequality across a society? Uh, yes, but remind me of your Becca. Becca, yes. Um, wealth inequality, I guess, has more like factors into it, like where you're from, less from, like things like that. Um, as well as wealth inequality can come from like, multiple generations, so if someone has like yeah. 10 generations of like rich grandparents, and, like they're obviously going to be more wealthy than. Yeah, that's exactly right. George, you want to add to that? Uh, wealth inequality is typically a product of income inequality because while income inequality is just how much you're gaining over a set period of time, wealth inequality um, is basically the accumulation of all of that income. Yeah, so I think both of those are right. And the thing that I would add to what George said, and I think this is what Becca's getting at, is that wealth inequality accumulates over generations, okay? Um, if you and someone else have the same income, okay, you could have, if you have the same job, you both work at, you know, the same job, and you have the same income, but one of you has a family that, you know, passed along uh, you know, some sort of house or um, some, uh, you know, source of, in a, 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 some set of resources that the other person doesn't have, you might have the same income, but you would have different wealth. And so you're right. Wealth inequality accumulates over generations, and so is typically greater than income inequality because it adds up. All right. Wealth inequality in the United States is, is quite significant. Um, the, uh, about, you, can, you can see here uh, the sort of share of the population and the percentage of the wealth. Okay? So how much, how much wealth they have and their net worth, and then uh, the share of the population. So you can see something like 12% of the population, somewhere in there, has a negative net worth. What does it mean to have a negative net worth? Um, you yeah. have more debt than you have wealth. You have more debt than you have assets. That's exactly right. So if you purchase a house, um, but you haven't paid off that house yet, and you, might, and you don't have a lot of resources in the bank, you might have a negative net worth. Or if you have taken out a payday loan, um, and you haven't paid back that payday loan yet, you don't have money in the bank to pay back that payday loan, you would have a negative net worth, okay? So about 12% of people in the United States have a negative net worth, meaning they, they owe more money than they currently have. They owe more resources than they currently have. On the other end of the scale, something about 1% to 2% of people have, you know, close to 
uh, you know, or uh, like that, they have close to more than ten million uh, dollars, and that is, you know, about they are taking about forty percent of the wealth of the United States. So uh, wealth inequality in the United States is very significant. About one percent of people have almost forty percent of the wealth, and then you know, there's you can see kind of the other sets of populations. There's a big group of people uh, who have you know, one to zero to a hundred thousand dollars and then it, it kind of increases. So um, that, that sort of shows you how in the United States um, wealth is not distributed equally. But in general, both in wealth inequality and income inequality are increasing over time, okay? There are variations from year to year. We're going to look at a, a recent variation in just a second, which is pretty interesting. Um, but if you're just talking about like on the scale of like your parents' lifetimes and your grandparents' lifetimes, income inequality is increasing and so is wealth inequality, okay? So if you look um, as the, at, you can look at the inequality from 1970, okay? The bars closer together. Inequality in 2018, bars further apart, okay? Wealth inequality, 1983, bars closer together. Wealth inequality in 2016, that more than 848,000 has, has increased dramatically, okay? So over the last few generations, both income inequality and wealth inequality have increased. And you'll notice again, wealth inequality greater than income inequality for the reason we just talked about. This wasn't always true. So for a really long time, or, or for a, 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 I mean a, a relatively long time, um, from the end of World War II until about 1980, income inequality existed, okay? But income sort of increased in lockstep, meaning people who earned lower incomes and people who earned higher incomes were increasing at about the same rate, okay? That doesn't mean that everyone was earning the same amount of money, okay? In like 1960, a CEO still earned a lot more than, you know, someone who wasn't the CEO at that company. But as the CEO's pay went up, kind of so did the lower workers in that same organization on a percentage basis. Everyone was kind of increasing together. And you'll notice that these three lines, so the red line is the 95th percentile, the sort of tannish line is the medium, and the blue line is the 20th percentile. Right until about 1980, they're increasing together, okay? And they, they go up and down, right? In the 1970s, there were like problems with oil, and you know, there were all sorts of economic issues, okay? And so you see a little dip, but they all dipped together. Starting at about 1980, the picture changed, okay? Starting at about 1980, now, uh, you know, income gains have increased a lot more for the people at the top than they have for the people at the bottom, okay? So the 20th percentile, it's still increasing, and you can see, you know, similar ups and downs, but the graphs are widening, okay? The gap between the richest people in our society and the poorest people in our society has increased dramatically since about 1980. We can talk about why that happened. There's a lot of reasons, um, but you can kind of see how that is going. And then um, income gains at the top are also increasing uh, much faster uh, than you know, everybody else. And so you can kind of see two, two different versions um, of one's in uh, percentages and one is uh, 1973 percentage. All right, here's one. Wealth inequality went down a little bit recently. So 2020, pandemic hits, and wealth inequality actually declines a little bit. Can anybody think about why wealth inequality might have declined a little bit at the beginning of the pandemic? This, this might require some knowledge of um, current events. It might require thinking back to maybe like what your parents were talking about at the beginning of the pandemic. Give it some thoughts. I'll take a couple thoughts and then I'll, I'll tell you what the, the most likely answer is. All right, go ahead, give it a, give it a try. Um, I would probably say because it was like economically, it was a huge shock okay. and uh, a lot of like huge businesses and companies were getting like, they were receiving less, um, less business than ever before. Okay, that's one possibility, yep. Um, probably because like a lot of different companies and stuff, like there was huge supply chain issues. Um, and a lot of people are also out of work. So okay. it kind of stopped like a, a significant like uh, proportion of people <clears throat> that weren't having income, which like wasn't helping them build up their wealth. Okay. Uh, yeah, way in the back. If people's wealth was contained within like um, a hedge fund or a savings account, those drops significantly because of the stock market. Okay. I want you to look for a second and see what's happening to their wealth. Okay. So this is from 2019 to 2021. Everybody's everybody's going up a 
little bit, but the bottom 50% is going up a lot. And I want you to think about why the bottom 50% might be increasing faster than everybody else. Something unique happened kind of at the beginning of the pandemic and then again at the beginning of 2021, if you want a clue. Yeah? Okay, I thought of two things. So one, maybe it's like wealth based stimulus, and then two, like worker demand rose up, so they didn't really feel like at the bottom of one or fifty or working in like a really labor intensive job. And those were like increasing in demand during the pandemic, so like workers could demand higher wages so in terms of like bigger home. Yeah, so that's for sure why their income increased. I want you to talk about that first thing for a second. Can you unpack that first thing for me? Yeah, so like basically if you were poor during the pandemic, uh, I forgot which president, obviously they're all the same to me at this point, but basically like <laughs> Uh, they released they release a bunch of stimulus packages to like basically offset like you know salary loss because right? you couldn't work outside for like one, right? And I think they give they give those to people like with, like they give them to lower income households. So like even if you were at the top, you wouldn't get it, but if you were at the bottom, you know, depending on your family. Yeah. So this is interesting. Everyone got a stimulus, um, at least in some of the rounds, but you're right that it was sort of phased out, um, and so based on your income you would make more at the bottom. Why was that so important for wealth for the bottom 50% of people in America? Why would a sudden injection of cash change their net worth so significantly and not change the net worth very much of the top 1%? Yeah? Um, when, they, like, when people in the bottom 50% would get the money, they would probably like, buy things like, like assets that would contribute to the net worth, like a house or a car. But like the top one percent, like would like if they already have like houses and stuff, they wouldn't necessarily buy that. Okay, so that's possible. They could be buying some assets. Rishi. The money that was given would be used as sort of a booster to help them grow more, invest in the stock market, and just get more and more money. Yeah, so all of those are possible. But I think it's it's honestly mostly even simpler than that, which is that if you don't have very much money. A relatively moderate amount of money increases your wealth by a lot. Remember, a couple slides ago, there's a bunch of people who have a negative net worth, right? So an increase, a stimulus of, you know, a, a pretty, you know, a, a, the stimulus that everybody got, it was somewhere between, I think, like two and $6,000, was like a big boost to the bottom 50%, okay? For someone who's making $10 million a year, Whatever the stimulus was, whether they got $700 or $6,000, that does not make a big difference to their wealth. But for someone who's living in poverty, that is a huge benefit, okay? And then, you're right, all of the other things you suggested are also probably part of that picture, which is, you know, people, the people who were, like, mostly working, wages went up a little bit for especially, um, like, workers in uh, service industries, like people who work at restaurants, that kind of thing, hotels. Um, once the economy started going again, uh, demand for those people went up a lot. Um, you know. But at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, the thing that is happening is we are giving a cash infusion to families and that that was very effective in increasing their wealth. One other thing that we didn't mention uh, is the child tax credit. So for a while at the beginning of the pandemic, we just gave a tax credit um, to anyone based on the number of children they had. And for people who are very wealthy, um, it didn't make very much of a difference because, you know, they're either not paying very much in taxes or um, they, you know, that, that number didn't make a very big difference to them. But for people who are struggling, that amount of tax credit um, was, was very great and so contributed pretty significantly to the bottom line. Now we're going to come back to that because this year's topic is asking us to think about what does it mean for the government to give infusions of either cash or jobs or benefits to people who are struggling. And how does that affect, you know, their position in society? How does that affect the inequality of income, the inequality of wealth, the inequality of economics? All right, income for what it's worth. Uh, the top 1% uh, of earners uh, increased their income quite dramatically during the pandemic. Um, the bottom groups did increase their earnings somewhat, but not nearly as fast as the top 1%. For what it's worth, the very bottom uh, 10%, so this is the bottom 90%, okay? The bottom 10% actually did increase their wages quite a bit for the reason um, you said over here, which is that there was a lot of demand for service workers um, as we came out of the pandemic, right? Um, lots of businesses were hiring and trying to get workers um, and trying to, you know, expand their businesses. Um, but overall, the bottom 90%, you know, barely increased. They were essentially flat between 2020 and now. 
but the top 1% has gone up a lot. Um, and the top 0.1% has gone up even more. Um, so income inequality did continue to increase um, during the pandemic, even though the bottom 10% is, is actually doing, was actually doing a little bit better for the reasons you suggested. So there are some existing federal policies um, that attempt to alleviate economic inequality. Um, and those policies are things like higher taxes for higher incomes, which we're going to talk about in a second, and also social services for lower income individuals. Um, but they don't actually narrow things very much. They narrow things some, okay? This is income before federal transfers and taxes, and this is income after federal transfers and taxes. So you'll see the bottom 20% goes from 4% of income to 8% of income distributed in society. But, but mostly, if you were to like look at these two pie charts from really far away, you'd be like, I don't know, I can't really, like, they're pretty similar. And the reason for that is because our existing federal programs, we do have a lot of them. Um, we have a lot of, we have, you know, a bunch of social service programs, but they don't do a ton to narrow income inequality in the United States. The United States also stands out pretty significantly in the world. We have relatively higher income inequality among the G7 countries. So these are the uh, democracies who we compare ourselves to economically on a, on a pretty large basis. We get together with these countries uh, to have economic discussions. Um, and the United States has the highest economic inequality um, of all of these countries. Um, the, um, the way that these numbers, these numbers are based on something called the Gini index, G-I-N-I, you'll see that sometimes. Um, and it is a measure where one is perfect inequality. One person in the country owns everything and everyone else has zero things, okay? And then a zero is everyone has the exact same amount. And so it's a, it's a big range, but the United States uh, is more unequal than UK, Italy, Japan, Canada, Germany, and France, the other sort of democratic uh, economies that we try and compare ourselves to. And here's a global comparison um, on this one. Same thing, so uh, the, the lighter colors is uh, more equal, the darker colors is more unequal. You can see the United States, it's not the very darkest of all of the darkest colors, the most unequal, um, but it is, you know, you can see compared to um, a lot of countries, the United States has, has more inequality um, than those other countries. All right, so. If I've convinced you that economic inequality is relatively high and increasing, the question is sort of why should we be concerned about that as a society? Obviously, individual people are concerned about that very much, right? Because they are thinking, you know, I need, I need more. It's not just relatively more, but there are lots of people who are living in poverty who, you know, just don't have enough resources. But there's sort of a question in um, economics literature about whether the issue is do you have enough? Or is it unequal? Okay, and I'm, I'm going to kind of break that down for a second. So there is a possibility that you could have a society where everyone has enough resources. Okay, everybody, you know, has enough. Have, they have health care. They have education. They have housing. You know, they they have they have food. They have they have all of their needs met. But it could still be a highly unequal society, right? Everyone has a lot. Just some people have a lot, a lot. Okay, and so there's sort of an empirical question about should we be concerned about that? Like, should we be more concerned about inequality, or should we be more concerned about just making sure everyone has enough? Um, and so there's, there's a set of economists who research that question. They research whether um, it's, you know, if, is it enough to just give everyone enough, or do we actually need to sort of work on making people more equal economically? Or should we kind of just let capitalism run its front? So there are a lot of empirical implications of economic inequality. Okay, these are things that are based not on do people have enough, but like what happens in societies where people are economically unequal. And there's, there's a lot of them. Um, we're going to talk about a bunch of them this year. Uh, there are more than are on this list, but these are kind of the, the, the biggies um, in terms of like why do we care about inequality itself, not just making sure everyone has enough. So the first one is that um, a lot of people have found that economic inequality lowers economic growth. That it's not just making sure everyone has enough, but actually the inequality itself, the existence of some people having more and some people having less, um, reduces both the economic growth and the economic stability of a society. Meaning whether that economy uh, is stable and functional or whether it goes up and down all the time uh, is based on inequality. Another one 
uh, has to do with increased populism and political instability. So countries with high inequality, as you might imagine, tend to be a little bit more politically unstable because there are a lot of people who see what other people have and, and are thinking, you know, why is our society so unequal? And that can create some significant political instability, which is something um, you'll be looking at with your lab later today. Another one is decreased trust in the government and democracy. So if you are in a society and you sort of look around and you see, you know, maybe I have enough, but there are a lot of people who have way more, you start to get concerned that maybe the government isn't looking out for you, okay? That the government is, is looking out for somebody and it's probably not you. Um, and that democracy is not protecting, you know, sort of the needs of everyone. That democracy is not taking care of everyone. Um, there are also some uh, empirical problems, uh, including shorter lifespans. So societies that are more equal, uh, sorry, more unequal, uh, people live a shorter amount of time, irregardless of how much that society has. Okay, so it's not about like some people don't have enough food. It's like if you have two societies where both, you know, everybody has enough, but one society is more unequal, the people live shorter lifespans in the more unequal society. Um, and so it's something about inequality itself. There's also worse public health, that even in societies where they provide, uh, you know, public health services, um, where, where health care is provided to people, unlike the United States, um, that public health is still worse in societies that are more unequal. And there's lower educational attainment, that again, even in societies where they try to provide you know, enough for everyone, inequality itself worsens economic, or academic achievement, worsens educational attainment. There are a lot more, but this kind of gives you a sense of sort of the range of things we're talking about when we're talking about inequality itself. Like, what does inequality itself do? So, we're going to get to some key concepts in the resolution, but first we're going to take a short break. So, if Social Security and basic income, okay? So, if by the end of this topic lecture, you understand fiscal redistribution, federal jobs guarantee, social security, and basic income, um, and you also uh, sort of have a sense that economic inequality in the United States is pretty high, um, that it's increasing over time, uh, and that it's high compared to our neighbors, I think you've gotten most of what you need to get out of the uh, lecture. So, fiscal redistribution. Fiscal redistribution. What is... Fiscal redistribution. Fiscal redistribution. Help, uh, let's let's break it down. What do we think is going on in fiscal redistribution? Yeah, what's your name? David. David, go ahead. So you take money from some people and you give it to other people. Okay, so it is taking money from some people and giving it to other people. Let's uh, add to that. Yeah, what's your name? Um, Logan. Logan, so like, go I think like, I know because I know like fiscal, like the definition, I think like it's more specific to like taxes. Okay. Like, like, like if the more you make, the higher your taxes are, which then goes back into society. Okay, so you're on to something about what fiscal means. Fiscal has to do with the distribution of money in society, in particular, money that's taken in by taxes. I like that. Uh, yes. Go ahead. A uh, tax and a transfer. A tax so and a transfer. Okay. We'll get to that in a second. What else, Rishi? Is fiscal redistribution the redistribution of income and wealth to even out the gap between the different uh, margins of society? Yeah, can you say it again without the word redistribution? The transfer of wealth from the higher parts of society that earn more income and wealth to the lower parts that could use it to even out the gap between the two. Yeah, y'all are onto something. So, fiscal redistribution fundamentally means what you think it means. It means distributing goods in a society differently. Okay, distributing our societal goods differently. From haves to have-nots. Okay, fiscal redistribution as a as sort of a term of art, as a term. Right, you could theoretically redistribute in any direction. But fiscal redistribution as a concept, as a societal and economic concept, as a government, a policy concept, uh, means distributing from people who have a lot to people who don't have nearly as much. It can't really be giving more to those who already have more, or at least debatably it can. It includes a tax and a transfer. That means applying a tax and then transferring the results of that tax to others. Applying a tax and then transferring the results of that tax to others. And the tax must be progressive. So, fiscal redistribution. Distributing societal goods differently from haves to have-nots. The process is a tax and a transfer, and the tax itself must be a progressive tax. 
Let's break that down. Econ 101. Who can explain the difference between a progressive tax and a regressive tax? A progressive tax and a regressive tax. Who, anyone taken economics recently? Feeling pretty good about it? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I think a progressive tax is when you tax those who uh, earn less, like less, and you tax those uh, who earn more, uh, more. Okay. A regressive tax is the opposite. A regressive tax is the opposite. That's exactly right. So, a progressive tax is a tax that takes a larger percentage of income from high income groups than lower income groups. It doesn't have anything to do with how high the tax is itself, but it has to do with the relative amount that people are taxed. So a progressive tax takes a more income, a larger percentage of income, a larger amount of income on a percentage basis, right? Not just like a larger amount of money, but actually a larger percentage of income from high income groups than from low income groups. And a regressive tax, you're right, is the exact opposite. It's a tax that takes a larger percentage of income from low income groups than from high income groups. Uh, bonus term is a proportional tax takes the same percentage of income from all groups. Can anyone come up with an example of a progressive tax in the United States? A United States tax that is progressive. A progressive tax in the United States. Um, I'm trying to see if I haven't heard from anybody yet. Yes, what's your name? Yeah, from um, Jake. Jake, go for it. Um, income tax? Income tax. Income tax is a good answer to that. Who else was going to say income tax? A bunch of you? Yeah. So income tax in the United States, we have tax brackets, okay? And so, you know, your first dollar is taxed less than your millionth dollar, which is taxed less than your hundredth millionth dollar, okay? That as your income goes up, the uh, taxes of your highest portion of your income um, are taxed higher than the lowest portion of your income. Does anybody know a tax in the United States that's regressive in effect? It's a regressive tax. In effect. The effect is that more pe low income people, the larger percentage of lower income people's uh, income goes to this tax than higher income people. Uh, yeah, Clint. Um, I think it's like uh, the one that, I mean, it's, it's like the one that you, sh that you sh sorry, it's, it's, it's the one that you pay for like when you're buying a good, then it takes like a little bit off, like if you buy something for a dollar, it's one ten. Yeah, what's that called? Sales tax. Sales tax. He's absolutely right. So a regressive tax in the United States, one of the most regressive taxes in the United States is a sales tax. You might be saying to yourself, I don't know, but like you have to pay sales tax when you buy a yacht. Like why is a sales tax regressive? Why is a sales tax regressive? In effect. Yeah. Because like, let's say it's like Florida or New York, like it will stay at 7%, like depending on like the state, like it's a specific like percent of whatever you're buying. Like if you buy something for like a dollar, It'll be a dollar and seven. Yeah. Why is that regressive in effect? Why does it mean that the ultimate effect is that lower income groups spend more on the sales tax, a larger percentage of their income to the sales tax than higher income groups? Because they have less money. Uh, yeah. Here. Yeah. Uh, because in a lower, people in a lower income group, they spend most of their income on buying things that they need, and or meaning they have less in savings, while higher income groups they have more, they put more of their income in savings. That's exactly and, right. So they have more of their income in savings, and they have more of their income not in like wealth goods. So like um, you know a house that might appreciate in value, that kind of thing. Um, the sales tax. It's like if you are spending most of your money on things like buying food and clothes and gasoline, um, and you know you're you're buying I don't know like toothpaste and all of the things you need to just like function in society. You're buying Advil. I don't know. Um, all, most of those things are sales tax, depending on the state. Some states don't tax food, some states don't tax clothes. Um, but if you're spending most of your income buying the goods that you need to continue like being a functioning human that's you know, participating in society, then you are spending a larger percentage of your income on the sales tax than someone who gets to save almost all of their income because they don't need to spend. Maybe they're spending the same amount as you. Maybe they're spending way more than you. But on a percentage basis, it's much higher. Um, somebody said another example of a regressive tax that I heard, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about that a little bit more later. But uh, yeah, go for it. Social security taxes. Social security taxes. Yep. And we're gonna talk about social security taxes, payroll taxes, um, in a little bit. Um, but you're right that they also have a, a relatively regressive effect. So. 
There are a bunch of ways that the government can raise revenue through taxation, okay? But some of the most common are increasing existing tax rates, okay? So now you pay X percent, now you pay X plus 5 percent, okay? Um, increasing an existing tax rate, creating a tax on something new. So if we, if the United States implemented a carbon tax, for example, that would be a new kind of tax. Or if they implemented a wealth tax, that would be a new kind of tax. And then another one is to close existing tax loopholes. So um, like closing the capital gains exemption tax or closing pass-through business exemptions. You don't need to know the details of this, um, but if you um, have ever heard of someone uh, going to an accountant to have them do their taxes, to like try to reduce their taxes, um, a lot of that is because there are a lot of loopholes um, and that allow you to legally reduce um, the amount of taxes you pay. And so Congress could decide we don't want those anymore um, and uh, raise revenue through taxation. So there are two largest sources of federal tax revenue. There are two largest sources of federal tax revenue. The first, as we've talked about, is relatively progressive income tax. And our income taxes fund the U.S. general funds. Okay, so when the government says that they like or have a new program for education, they have a new program, like we're buying some new weapons system, we are building some, you know, if, uh, you know, if we're building something, infrastructure, um, that is paid through the general funds, um, and that is paid by workers, okay? So you earn money, if you had a summer job this summer, um, you would earn some money, and then you would have to pay income tax at the end of the year, and if you just had a summer job, you're not paying very much, um, but uh, income, everyone pays income tax at some level, um, and it is paid just by the workers. So um, at the end of the year, you are going to get a um, statement from your employer. So I was just emailing with Emory because they have my wrong address, so they're going to send my statement at the end of the year to a place I haven't lived in 12 years. We're working on it. But at the end of the year, Emory's going to send me a, a statement, and they'll say, you earned this amount of money, and I'll have to enter that in, um, you know, fill out my own tax forms, or some people use a form like, you know, a program like TurboTax or whatever, and you've put in all the numbers, and then it spits out, here's how much you owe, okay? Um, and that is income taxes. So if you hear um, your parents are doing their taxes at the end of the year, maybe they're doing them themselves, maybe they're going to an accountant, but we gotta do our taxes. Most of the time in the United States, we're talking about income taxes, okay? At the end of the year, um, April 15th, tax day, you're paying your income taxes. And it's paid by workers. The other type of tax um, is called payroll tax. And payroll taxes fund special programs, including unemployment, Social Security, and Medicare. Um, and payroll taxes are uh, pay, paid by both workers and employers, so um, basically 50-50 split on who's paying what for that worker. Um, but basically the business pays for every worker they have, and they also generally deduct money um, from a person's paycheck um, to, uh, so it's like money that comes off the top. Um, for Social Security and Medicare. So if you get a paycheck um, and you get a monthly paycheck, it will often say right on it, like Social Security, Medicare. And it's like, where did all my money go? I thought that I was making X amount of money, now I'm making X minus Y amount of money. And that's because um, that they have deducted off the top the payroll tax. Um, and it's, so it's paid by both workers and employers and it funds those special programs. As discussed, income tax is more progressive. Payroll tax is relatively less progressive um, because it is, uh, you know, it's just it's just set up that way, um, and so it is a it is a less progressive form of taxation uh, in the United States. So people complain about taxes a lot. I, this is not someone doing their taxes; they're like filling out a scantron. But it was the closest picture I got um, of someone who looks concerned. They're they're filling out their taxes. But uh, taxes overall in the United States have actually gone down pretty significantly, especially for the highest earners, okay? So if you look at the top marginal tax rate, okay, that means how much in taxes you're paying on like that last dollar you earn, okay, that has fallen dramatically, okay? So in the 1920s it was low and then shot way up uh, through the 50s and the 60s, it remained really high, started falling in the 70s, fell precipitously again in the 80s, and now it's like waffled around there in the middle. That's that green line. So that's how much do the wealthy pay at the on the very top part of their income. Not on the first you know, $20,000 they earn, um, but how much uh, the top marginal tax rate 
Um, on the income tax is the green line. The top corporate tax rate is the purple line. So you'll see that over time, the top rate, meaning the rate the highest earners or the people with the most, the highest earning corporations and the highest earning individuals pay, um, has fallen pretty significantly. At the same time, the payroll tax rate has like tick, 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 ticked up. Um, and so that's part of the reason that, as we were talking about a minute ago, uh, that the payroll tax is, is less progressive, that it, it continues to increase even as um, you know, the top marginal tax rate um, has continued to decrease. I saw a hand, but I don't remember where it was. Yes? But like, is that like kind of a correlation? Like, we paid more in taxes, but the interest rate was lower? Because like, like the interest rate right now is like the highest it's ever been since I don't remember what year, but like, so, taxes are kind of like yeah, so up. interest rate is a, is a separate question. Interest rate is how much you pay on money that you take out. So yeah, if you yeah, take out a loan or if you take out a mortgage. mortgage yeah. um, and, and definitely, there is some correlation between those two. But the, the thing to understand is like in the 1950s, okay, the marginal tax rate for the very wealthy was like sitting up at about 90%, which means the wealthiest people in society not on all of their money, but on that last set of their money, we're paying like 90% in taxes. Now, it's hovering right around, it's like under 40%, I think it's about 38% right now. Um, so that has declined significantly over time. Um, and so, you know, even, even when people say taxes are high, historically, they're not. Part of the problem is that, you know, people, like, People who are earning money now were mostly not earning money in, in 1943, right? Um, and so it's like our memories are very short. Um, we remember the last tax cut or the last tax increase. We remember, you know, how much we paid last April. We don't really remember, like, you know, in, in 1953 it was much higher. There's inflation, right? There is inflation, but this uh, takes into account inflation. So this is, I think. I, uh, it's, it's your only block quote of the entire lecture, but I thought it was worth it, so I'm just going to read it to you. Since the late 1960s, the share of federal revenue paid by working Americans in the form of payroll taxes has increased from just over 20% to 35%. Yet, corporate tax collections have plummeted from more than 25% to less than 10% of revenues. Okay, so like where the government gets its money used to be 25% from corporate taxes, now it's less than 10%. And the top rate paid by wealthy filers has fallen from 70% during Lyndon Johnson's presidency to 37% today. And over the last two decades, Congress has hollowed out the estate tax to an extent that only 0.2% of estates pay any tax at all. Okay, so on a historical basis, taxes on the wealthy in the United States are relatively low. On a historical basis. Federal revenue from taxation has also decreased even as our spending has increased. So if you, um, you know, hear us talking about like the debt or the deficit, those kinds of things, part of the reason for that is that our revenue has, has been declining even as our spending has increased. Um, so federal spending and federal revenue don't have to move in lockstep, okay? But for a long time, they kind of did. So it was like, we needed to buy more things, then we'd increase taxes. We don't need more, you know, it's like they were, they were going up and down together. And then, for a while, uh, our, now our spending has been higher than our revenue with a, with a brief flip-flop right around 2000. Um, but it means that the amount of money that the federal government, inflation adjusted, that the federal government takes in from taxes has actually been declining a little bit, mostly because of tax cuts. And U.S. revenue is relatively low compared to other countries. So one of the interesting things about the United States um, is that we have a like federal and state set of taxes. A lot of other countries just have countrywide taxes. They don't have this like federalist system where we have all these states and like you know Montana can have a totally different tax rate than New Hampshire, which doesn't have income tax. Um, and you know there's there's all different levels. But um, the even looking at sort of the OECD average for all the different countries, um, and where the United States is, without, with just the federal government, we're like historically low. We're, we're, we're lower than all the countries on this list. Um, when you add in state and local revenue, we're still you know, sitting way at the end of the bar chart in terms of how much the federal government um, takes in as a percentage of their GDP, right? So it's like the United States economy is very large, we obviously take in more than a bunch of these other countries, but as a percentage of our GDP, 
we take in a lot less. So, fundamentally, the resolution is asking the affirmative to propose a progressive tax and then transfer the funds generated by that tax to lower income individuals. Okay, so it is asking us to propose a progressive tax, transfer those funds to lower income individuals. And there's, there's a bunch of ways we could do that. We could propose a new tax, right? We could increase existing tax rates. We could close loopholes. Um, but you've got to propose a progressive tax and then transfer the funds to lower income individuals. So there are some different ways to transfer resources, OK? I think you can just, just sort of listen to these. If you want to write it down, that's OK. Um, but the two main ways that a government transfers resources are in-kind benefits and cash transfers. In-kind benefits and cash transfers. So an in-kind benefit provides an actual good or service to someone. So food stamps is an in-kind benefit because you are not giving them money to buy food. You are literally like giving them a stamp that can only be traded for food, which is called SNAP, uh, is, is a uh, supplemental nutrition assistance program. That's what food stamps is called now. Uh, housing assistance, where you provide someone a house. That is an in-kind benefit. Medical care is an in-kind benefit, right? You're not giving somebody a bunch of money and saying, like, you can use it on medical care if you want. You're, like, directly providing or directly reimbursing just for medical care. And most federal poverty programs are conducted this way. Um, but it's relatively less redistributive um, because the actual funds go to the service providers. And I want you to think about that for a second. So um, if I provided your family um, with a voucher that allows you to have a house, okay, or a, an apartment, um, you would get that housing, but the money transfer doesn't go to you, it goes to your landlord, right? The federal government is paying your landlord, and then your landlord is, is giving you that apartment, okay? So the money itself goes to the landlord. Same thing with medical care. If you are given, uh, you know, free medical care because you are a lower income individual and so you have, uh, you know, Medicaid, um, you get the medical care, but your doctor is the one that gets the money. Does that make sense? The money goes to the doctor. Same thing with food stamps, right? You get the food stamp, but the grocery store is the one that's actually getting the revenue. They're the ones that are making money on the deal. Um, and so um, most of Obama's expansions in the safety net uh, went to in-kind benefits. The biggest examples in the United States are Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare and Medicaid together are 25% of the federal budget. Okay, it's a, it's a huge amount. Sometimes uh, uh, in-kind benefits has been referred to as feeding the sparrows by feeding the horses. Okay, feeding the sparrows by feeding the horses. This was uh, former Senator Daniel, Daniel Patrick Moynihan uh, described it as feeding the sparrows by feeding the horses. And the idea uh, is that the people living in poverty are getting just a tiny little bit um, that uh, is left over when you feed the horses and the horses like drop you know pieces of uh, grain or whatever. Um, but the idea is that pay, it pays middle class and upper class providers to deliver services to the people who are living in poverty rather than providing direct benefits to people living in poverty. The second way to transfer resources is kind of the opposite. It's a cash transfer, okay? It's a cash transfer that provides money directly, okay? It provides money directly. It tends to be much more efficient than program, like these other programs, because it, it has a lot less overhead, a lot less to administer, a lot less to manage, okay? And uh, it is much more redistributive, because you are actually providing the money to the people who are struggling, um, and then allowing them to decide what they want to do with those resources. Um, only about 18% of the federal total spent on poverty programs is via cash transfer. Only about 18%, or sorry, yeah, 18% um, is spent on federal poverty programs is by a cash transfer. The very biggest, by far, is Social Security. Okay, so Social Security, uh, we will talk about a lot in detail, and in, in when we get to that section on the, uh, you know, because that's one of the programs that you can do this year. Um, but it is about 24% of the federal budget, and most of the benefits are not means tested. What's means tested? What does it mean to means test a program? Anybody know? Actually roll it out and see what the effects are. Well, that's an interesting possibility, but no. Means tested? All right, so over here, when you earlier today were talking about um, the stimulus, 
you said something. It's okay. You're good. Uh, I won't. I won't put you on the spot. But he said something oh, about right. how uh, people got more and some people got less, and how do we decide that? Does anybody know? Can you figure out what means tested might mean? Yeah. Oh, it's like let's say like you made thirty thousand one year and qualified for it, mm -hmm. but then the next year you made three million dollars. Like they'd make sure that you're not getting. Yeah. Like Medicaid, because exactly. obviously you could afford So a means-tested program means that they assess, they test your means, your ability to pay, okay, before deciding whether you're eligible for that program. Um, and one of the interesting things about Social Security is most of the benefits are not means-tested. Every elderly person is available, eligible for Social Security, whether they have, you know, a ton of money or whether they're living in poverty. And so um, it is a cash transfer um, that... Uh, but it is not um, potentially as redistributive as it could be because it is, it is uh, not means tested. Um, other examples of uh, cash transfer programs are temporary assistance to needy families, TANF, um, also known as welfare. Okay, that is a, a cash transfer program. It's cash benefits to poor families. Um, and then supplemental security income. SSI, which is cash and uh, benefits to people who are living in poverty and also have a disability. Um, so those are those are sort of the main ways the government transfers resources through social services. Um, they can also there are some also some examples where the government provides subsidies for something. Okay, so they like give make something cheaper um, by subsidizing it. Um, there are examples where they provide some services directly, although they mostly don't. Mostly the government um, contracts with people or gives uh, a rebate kind of thing for doing those things. And then the last one is tax rebates, um, that you could give people a reduction in their taxes um, for a, a specific thing. But most benefits, most social services, are in-kind benefits or cash transfers. For what it's worth, the biggest tax rebate is the Earned Income Tax Credit, the EITC, which is rebates on payroll taxes to lower income working families. All right, why? Why are most federal programs in-kind benefits rather than cash transfers? Remember we said, you know, like 18% is cash transfers and all the rest of that um, is, is in-kind benefits. Why? Why? Ben. I think you're on to something. Does somebody want to expand on what Ben's saying? He, he's saying they don't want to pay lower income people cash directly, and I think he's on to something. Uh, yeah, it's you know. Because in cash transfers, the, the individuals get to choose how to spend their money, but in the in kind benefits, the government is choosing where and when they spend. That's exactly right. So you were both on to it. If you were also kind of thinking that, that's, that's mostly the reason. Um, cash transfers tend to be much less popular um, than in-kind benefits, even though cash transfers are much more redistributive, um, because uh, there's sort of a belief uh, in society that some people have uh, that people living in poverty like can't manage their own affairs, and so um, they might misspend the money, they might choose to get how to, they might they get to choose how to spend the money, um, and Congress sometimes sees that as a bad thing, that, they, that people living in poverty get to choose how to spend their money is seen as a bad thing, not a good thing. Um, and there's, there's obviously a, a good other side to that um, that argues that that's like extremely paternalistic and just like fundamentally wrong. Um, but that's why, from a political perspective, that most of our benefits um, are in-kind benefits rather than cash transfers. Another one um, that I think is, is sort of a, a subcurrent to that um, is that a lot of times people in Congress see poverty as sort of a temporary condition that we need to alleviate, not a long-term condition that requires ongoing transfers or subsidies. Um, so if we, you know, if we give you some medical care, you know, while you're struggling, while you have a health condition, we can like fix the problem, rather than seeing it as, you know, a structural part of a capitalist society that we need to alleviate um, with ongoing transfers or subsidies. So, what methods of transfer are included in the resolution? There are three. There are three methods of transfer that are included in the resolution. So this is what we're going to be debating about this year. Um, is adopting a federal jobs guarantee, expanding Social Security, and providing a basic income. Those are, those are the three 
so sort of areas of the resolution. If somebody says, what are the areas in the resolution? If you're, if you go, if you're a commuter and you go home tonight, your family's like, hey, what are you debating about this year? You'd be like, well, we're debating about income inequality, but, and, and, you know, fiscal redistribution. But in specific, we'll be debating about federal jobs guarantees, social security, and basic income. Okay? Those are sort of the, the three areas of the top. So, federal jobs guarantee. What is a federal jobs guarantee? What is a federal jobs guarantee? What does it mean to provide a federal jobs guarantee? If you are sitting there and you haven't said anything yet, and you're like, I'm a little nervous, but I know what the word federal means, I know what a job is, and I know what a guarantee is, I am guessing that it, this is your moment to take a risk. Um, I, I am betting um, that, that you're going to take a, a pretty good run at it. All right, Beth, what's a federal jobs guarantee? Um, I can assume that it's essentially ensuring that people have some sort of job in the federal government. Yeah, that's exactly right. A federal jobs guarantee, anyone who wants a job is eligible for a federal program. It's a massive expansion of federal hiring programs like we did in the New Deal um, or the 1970s public service employment where the federal government hires a bunch of people who wouldn't otherwise be hired. What are some of the things, those of you who have taken U.S. history recently, what are some of the things uh, that the New Deal did in their hiring programs. What are what are some of the things we, we did? Yeah. We created the CCC or the Civilian Con Conservation Corps. Civilian Conservation Corps, that's exactly right. What did they do? They uh, <coughs> went to like, national parks and like uh, wildlife places and they like built things and yeah. like, maintained the place. What else did we do uh, in the New Deal to build things? When the federal government was like, we're going to hire a bunch of people, we're going to hire them to do some things. Yeah. The Works Progress Administration. Okay. Yeah, infrastructure. We built the National Highway. We started, well, we, we didn't build highways until later, but we started building lots of infrastructure um, in the South. Does anybody know, have heard of the Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA? What did they do? Uh, they built, like, floodgates and stuff. Yeah, floodgates or dams. They built a bunch of dams um, and used those dams to provide electricity to the South, okay? Most of the rural South. Um, you know, in the 1920s did not have electricity, um, and so we, the federal government, hired a bunch of people, um, and uh, they used it for a, a variety of projects, okay? So a federal jobs guarantee would be an expansion of those programs. New Deal, 1970s, they didn't hire anyone who wanted to, but they hired a whole lot of people. Um, under a federal jobs guarantee, anyone who would want to work would be eligible for the program, and if they can't find a private sector job, right, they can't find a job like working for a business or working for a corporation or, you know, working in a restaurant, that kind of thing, the government will provide them a job. And so it essentially guarantees full employment in society, that any person who would like to have a job um, would have a job. It, it sort of eliminates unemployment in one fell swoop um, and uh, with pay sufficient to provide a living wage is generally how it's proposed. Um, the Center on Budget and Policy propo uh, Priorities proposed one of these recently um, and said that we should have what they called a National Investment Employment Corps. Um, so you'll see the, the, if you're researching a federal jobs guarantee, you'll see that proposal a lot, the NIEC. And the idea would be it provides jobs for everybody, it increases the minimum wage, and it gives, those jobs have to have benefits, um, including health care coverage. One of the things that's kind of interesting is the actual unemployment rate meaning the percentage of people who do not have jobs, um, is much higher than the reported unemployment rate. Um, and the reason for that is because some people have stopped looking for work. And so the way we report unemployment is like, we send out questionnaires and are like, hey, are you looking, do you have a job? And they're like, you're like, yes. They're like, okay, good talk. Um, if they're like, no, I don't have a job. You're like, are you looking for a job? And if you're like, no, I'm not looking for a job. I'm at debate camp. Um, then you would not be included. None of you would be included either because you're not adults. But um, if you uh, are an adult who's like, no, I'm not looking for a job, you're not included in the unemployment rate. If you're you know, um, a stay-at-home parent or you're taking care of an elderly relative or you've just stopped looking for work because you can't find a job, you're not included in the unemployment rate. And so a federal jobs guarantee um, would provide jobs for all of those people as well as the people who are included in the existing um, federal unemployment rate. So what kinds of jobs would be included? Um, really, it could be anything. A federal jobs guarantee could really hire people to do anything, okay? But the most popular federal proposals fall into three categories. Environment care, like green jobs, okay? So like greening the economy. Uh, community care, that's like um, taking care of 
uh, you know, like building um, infrastructure, that kind of thing. And people care. Paying people to take care of other people. There are lots of people, um, you know, who need more assistance than they're getting. And this would provide jobs to, for example, maybe you have, um, you know, an elderly relative who lives kind of nearby. And right now, um, you know, your family goes and looks in on them all the time and is like taking care of their house and like making sure they get groceries, taking them to the doctor, that kind of thing. Well, that is not remunerated right now. Most of the time you don't get paid for that. Um, but a federal jobs guarantee could make that count as work, right? Obviously, you know, taking someone else to the doctor is, is a form of work. It's just not a form of wage work. And so a um, federal jobs guarantee for the people care category um, could include uh, those kinds of things. All right, drawbacks and objections. This is where I, I turn to you all. So um, I have pitched sort of lightly pitched a federal jobs guarantee. It would eliminate unemployment. It would create all these ancillary benefits like to the people or the environment um, or to the community. What are the drawbacks and objections? Why, why don't we have a federal jobs guarantee? Uh, all right, one, oh my gosh, okay, way back in the back, yeah. Okay, so hurt private businesses is like the number one probably reason we don't have a federal jobs guarantee. If I could uh, get a guaranteed job instead of working at the like lowest wage job in society, then all of a sudden, those lowest wage jobs that people don't really want, but they take them because they're desperate, maybe those don't start to look so good, right? If I could, um, you know, work in my community cleaning up parks, maybe I would like much rather do that um, than be a dishwasher or um, be a an agricultural worker um, in the, you know, in Georgia in the summer. Maybe I would rather do that than, um, you know, working for Tyson at uh, you know, their chicken processing plant, okay? Uh, it would put pressure on those businesses, um, and all of a sudden those jobs would have competition where maybe they don't now. So yes, her private businesses is definitely an objection. Uh, yes, George? Typically lower unemployment leads to higher inflation, and that would hurt everyone. Not okay, only. yep, so inflation is another example of a concern. So if everybody has more money, all of a sudden, Goods are also going to cost more because everyone can buy those goods, so that will increase the cost of those goods. Um, and all of a sudden, we have inflation, um, and maybe that is bad. So if you noticed, if you've like gone to the grocery store recently and been like, cheese and crackers, why do eggs cost six dollars now? Um, the reason for that is is you know inflation on uh, food products, which is has you know increased dramatically. It's it's down quite a bit now from from where it was. But yes, inflation, um, absolutely. Uh, ben, were you going to say inflation too? Okay. Uh, yes. The government doesn't have any money. The government doesn't have any money. Okay, it's very expensive. We looked at uh, sort of that question about, um, you know, we, when we looked at that graph, it was like, here's our spending and here's our revenue. Revenue below spending, right? Maybe it's too expensive, um, and and we just we just can't do it. Can't can't provide it. Uh, um, like. Because some of the people might not have like as much experience with that type of field, maybe they won't like they have to do the best job for that. Okay. So yeah, there's like um, in order to get people working in jobs that they haven't had before, you have to like either train them a lot, which is very difficult, or they like might be bad at their jobs. Um, and so uh, the sort of two things that I think are are encompassed there um, are both that it's kind of difficult to administer, right? You have to like figure out what all these people are going to do. And I don't know if you've ever run a project um, where you have a bunch of volunteers, but it's like all the volunteers are doing is just like milling around chaotically and they're not really helping and like nobody really knows what they're doing. Um, sometimes, you know, like two people working on a project easier than seven people working on a project. If you've heard of a group project at school and you were like, you know, everyone's trying, but it's like more work to coordinate these people than it is to just like do the project myself. Um, that is some of the difficulties with administration on a federal job guarantee. Um, part of it is also um, what they call make work jobs. What's a make work job? Anybody ever heard that concept where it's making work? We do literally make it up like it's probably not that useful. Yeah, it's probably not that useful. So if any of you have a, have a younger sibling um, and your family is trying to teach your younger sibling like how to do chores, okay, and they're like, you know, five years old and you're like, all right. We're going to teach this five-year-old like how to wash the dishes, okay? Now, having teaching that five-year-old how to wash the dishes is like a thousand times harder than just washing the dishes yourself. And you're not, you're just like making up chores 
for them to do. Um, a lot of jobs in a federal jobs guarantee, they are jobs where we've just sort of tried to create a job, but we don't actually have a need for that job in society. And so matching the needs to the jobs can be really difficult. Um, and so sometimes those are called like fake jobs or make work jobs, meaning they, you know, you, you do the job and you get paid for it, uh, but you're not actually providing a ton of societal benefit. So you all came up with all of the examples that I come up with or the drawbacks and objections that I come up with. It's expensive, it might cause inflation, it is difficult to administer, it might hurt private businesses either from trade-offs or economic pressure, um, and that many of the jobs are, are fake make work jobs. Those are the biggest objections to a federal jobs here. All right, next category of the resolution, social security. Social security, we've talked about it a little. Who can unpack for me what social security is? There's, there's a couple different components. What's the biggie? What's, if you had someone who's like, I've started getting social security, what's happening? Yeah. It's like retired people, like over 65, getting like, uh, like not a paycheck, but like money from the government because they like, are, because they like, don't have to work anymore. Yeah, it's, it's a retirement income provided to retired people, elder, you know, older people in society. Um, and it is, uh, you know, it's, it is a cash benefit. Um, so if you have a family member who started getting Social Security, they get like a check every month. I think now it's like an electronic funds transfer. But um, you get an amount of money provided by the government every month. And the biggest, uh, the biggest set of benefits is to retired persons. So Social Security has three categories. The biggest by far is retirement insurance benefits, retirees, financial benefits for retirees. A second set of benefits is for disabled individuals. Um, so if somebody uh, has a permanent disability, they can apply for Social Security um, and they would get a small benefit um, on it every month. If you've ever heard somebody referring to it as like being on disability, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about Social Security disability insurance um, and that that um, you know, is a financial benefit provided to um, people who are disabled in a way that doesn't allow them to work. So if you have a disability but you can still work, you're probably not eligible. But if you have a disability in a way that means like you are not able to work, um, you apply for Social Security and might get SSDI. The last category is survivors. Um, and survivors means um, either you um, had a spouse that was eligible for Social Security and that spouse passed away. So even if you're not yet eligible for Social Security um, or you didn't pay in enough to be eligible for Social Security, um, you could get their benefits. Okay, so that's spousal benefits. And the other one is children's benefits. So if an adult person um, has children and that adult person is killed, um, those like it passes away, um, those children get survivor benefits until they become 18, and that's, that's based on Social Security. So there are 65 million people who receive Social Security benefits each year as of 2020, um, and retirement insurance benefits are the biggest group by far, and again, they're funded by payroll taxes. So as, as we talked about earlier, Social Security is about 24% of the federal budget. The money is transferred from wage earners in the form of payroll taxes, so wage earners, people who are earning a wage, pay payroll taxes. Remember, both the company and the individual pay payroll taxes. And then it's transferred to people with disabilities or people who are retired. Uh, and most of them, uh, most of, so the, uh, and, and most of the benefits are not means tested, meaning every elderly person is about eligible for Social Security no matter how much money they have. So Social Security, how can you expand it? Okay, there's a lot of details in Social Security expansion proposals, okay, but most of them fall into one of these categories. Okay? You could increase the payment amounts. Okay, that's the simplest. Like people are getting X amount of money now, now they get X plus Y amount of money. We used to get this amount of money in Social Security, now we get this amount of money in Social Security. Another possibility is lowering the retirement age. So if more people are eligible for Social Security um, because you know, the retirement age is now, I don't know, 59, um, then that would expand Social Security. It would expand the percent of people who are eligible for Social Security. And then another method of 
expanding Social Security is to expand eligibility groups. So right now, for example, uh, people with disabilities have a really hard time getting through social, getting Social Security. It's like a very rigorous process. Most people get denied, then you have to appeal, then you get denied again, then you have to appeal again. Then some people have to actually get a lawyer and like sue, um, and eventually they might get Social Security disability benefits. We could make that a lot easier um, if we wanted to. We could uh, cover more disabilities, cover more people with disabilities, make that process easier. So basically just like expand the eligibility groups for people um, who, are, who get Social Security. You could also do other things to expand the eligibility groups too. You could like um, cover children after age 18. Um, you could uh, cover uh, partners that aren't married, so uh, non, like married, not spouses, but cover, you know, somebody's domestic partner, that kind of thing. Um, all of those would be expansions to Social Security benefits. Yeah? What percentage of the federal budget did you say? 24%. It's big. It's big. So, drawbacks and objections. What are some drawbacks and objections to expanding Social Security? Social Security to uh, making a lower retirement age, 
Wouldn't that also inwardly uh, affect the federal jobs guarantee to only a certain AIDS group? Like, if I made it so you could retire at 50, then the federal jobs guarantee would be only 0 to 50. Yeah, so there's, there's sort of two parts there. I, I like the way you're thinking about it. Um, probably, uh, we, w we would be thinking about these proposals separately. So probably, the affirmative, um, is going to propose one of these things, not all of these things. But you're right, if you did like an expansion of Social Security and a Federal Jobs Guarantee, it really changes who's eligible for the Federal Jobs Guarantee for sure. All right. Universal in parentheses, basic income. We'll talk about the parentheses in a second. But what does it mean to provide a basic income or a universal basic income? What does that mean? Providing a universal basic income or a basic income, yeah, right here. Um, so sort of like the stimulus checks that we talked about earlier, providing a, a universal basic income would be giving uh, everybody a certain amount of money like every month. Exactly. It's, it's an income that everybody gets provided by the government. Yep, that's exactly right. Does anybody know what United States state? You got, you got 50 choices. What United States state has a basic income? What United States state has a basic income? And bonus, why? Ben. It is not New York. That was a good guess. Uh, yeah. California? Not California. Another good guess. If you're Googling right now, that was a good strategy. So I saw a bunch of hands go up. And my guess is that those hands went up in exactly the amount of time it took to Google that. And that was a really good strategy. You're never going to get in trouble at debate camp uh, for Googling something because um, you're just doing your little research skills. But I think I heard the answer over here. Did you have it before you Googled? I didn't Google it. Okay. I know it's Alaska, but I don't know why. Yeah, you know it's Alaska, but you don't know why. All right, somebody that Googled, does anybody know why? Yeah. That's exactly right. So Alaska has what's called the Alaska Permanent Fund. Um, and each person who lives in Alaska, each adult who lives in Alaska, gets about $2,000 a year. It goes up and it goes down. Um, but you get about $2,000 a year just for living in Alaska. And it's based on Alaskan, uh, Alaska's oil. Um, but the key po components of a universal basic income, OK, universal basic income, are that every adult gets an equal amount of money distributed periodically. Whoever said that is like exactly right. Every adult gets an equal amount of money distributed periodically. So it's kind of like that first stimulus check, where it's like everybody, I think it was $2,000. I think it just everybody got $2,000 from our partner. It is not means tested, OK? A, a, a basic income or a universal basic income is not means tested, meaning whether you make $5,000 a year or you make $50 million a year, you're still getting that same amount just deposited in your bank account every month, okay? It's not means tested. It's also not tied to work, okay? Whether you are working or not working, you would get a basic income. Yeah, Ben? Yeah, so they do, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. They do tax it, but, uh, it, well, it depends. You can set it up either way, right? We don't have a universal basic income. So um, someone who proposed a universal basic income could propose it to be tax-free, um, or they could propose it to be taxed. If it is taxed, obviously the people who are the wealthiest or who have the most income would have it taxed the most, and the people who have the least would have it taxed the least, because we do have a progressive income tax. But that was a good question. So it's not tied to having a job. If you are an adult who is a college student, okay, you would get your universal basic income. If you are a parent who is staying home with your young children, you would get your universal basic income. If you are a retiree who is uh, you know, retired, you would get your universal basic income. If you are someone who just did not want to work, you would get your universal basic income. If you are someone who wanted to be an artist, but you weren't making any money from your art yet, you're just like trying to become an artist, you would get your universal basic income. One of the benefits is that it's a lot easier to administer than a federal jobs guarantee. One of the reasons that those initial uh, COVID stimulus checks weren't means tested was not because they didn't necessarily want to means test them. It is because it is a total pain to figure out what each person owes and what each person should get. Okay, because you have to like wait for them to file their taxes and then you have to like look at each tax bracket. It is like a thousand times easier for Alaska to just be like $2,000 a year in your bank account. Okay, um, and you know, if the federal government did this, it would be very easy. They already have most people. They would either send them a check um, or, you know, deposit it in their bank account. Obviously, you would have to do a lot of figuring out about people who are unhoused or people who are transient. But um, the idea is that it's a way easier to administer than trying to give everybody a job. 
Okay. Um, and it gives people freedom to take low income jobs. So there are a lot of jobs that people would really like to do, um, but they don't pay enough to pay a living wage. Okay. There are a lot of people who, you know, might want to uh, work in a restaurant, but they're like, I have kids, I can't afford to do that. There are presumably a lot of people who would like to be teachers, um, and some of them are teachers, uh, and some of them have decided that that's like not their best economic choice, right? Um, there are a lot of jobs in society that are very, uh, they like bring a lot of fulfillment to those people, but they don't pay enough. One of the things that's the most interesting is like, you know, child care is extremely expensive, but child care workers, like, like people who work in daycares, have extremely low wages. And, you know, if you could get a basic income and you liked doing that job, then maybe you'd be a lot more fulfilled than you would be otherwise. Um, artists, um, creators, inventors who haven't invented the, like, made, the, made it big yet, um, all of those people um, would have the freedom to do those things with a, a basic income. So, drawbacks and objections. All right, we got our, we got our drawbacks and objections. Uh, do I see any new Really? All right, George is a newish hand. Go ahead. Where is the money coming from? Where is the money coming from? Where is the money coming from? Yep, where is the money coming from? It's expensive. Absolutely. All of these things are expensive. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge whether the government can afford them. Saying the government can or can't afford things is really a question of policy priorities. It's not a question of economics a lot of the time. But you're right. Expensive is definitely an objection. Um, and it's an it's objection uh, you would hear right away if you proposed a, a universal basic income. Uh, Fletcher. Um, what happens since we're giving this to literally everyone? Mm -hmm. That rather inflation just occurs and it has little to no effect because, like, if someone's making five hundred thousand dollars a year and then they get that that benefit, then someone's making like forty thousand dollars a year, you get that same benefit. Maybe it'll make everything inflate, so we'll just say the same. Yeah. So might cause inflation. Um, is definitely uh, another concern for sure. Yep. Uh, it would it, it would hurt, it would hurt those lower income jobs. It would actually hurt jobs that people might less people would be taking jobs because if they can live off the universal basic income, why work? Yeah. So people would just stop working. It's similar to the federal jobs guarantee that it would hurt uh, businesses who have hard to fill jobs. Um, but it might hurt them even more because now they're not just competing against a federal jobs guarantee where you maybe are working in a park or you're, you know, building uh, green tech or, you know, working on a wind farm or something. All of a sudden now you're just competing against don't work, okay? Um, and, and, you know, there would be a certain percentage of society that decides not to work. For what it's worth, um, you know, I don't, I think that that objection is like less concerning um, than maybe people think it would because I do think that most people um, would want more than the universal basic income would provide. Um, if you've ever you know, heard somebody take a promotion, even though they have to work more, it's like if any, if any of your family members have ever taken a promotion, it's like, all right, you know, I gotta work more because I just took this promotion, but I get paid more. You know, that is the same for the universal basic income. For the universal basic income, you'd have to be, you, you know, the, the desire to not work would have to be very high compared to the desire uh, to make more money. But you're right, those are, those are the main drawbacks and objections. That it's expensive, it might mean people just don't work. I didn't include inflation on this one, but it definitely is. Uh, might hurt private businesses from trade-offs or economic pressure. And then there's also this just sort of idea that we have in society that like work brings people joy, that work is fulfilling. <laughs> Um, but maybe you don't know work is fulfilling. So, um, you know, if I woke up this morning and I was like, I have a choice right now if I want to go to the Indian and teach a topic lecture or I want to stay home in bed. While I'm sitting home and my, my dog is like sitting next to me and she's like, play with me, play with me. Maybe at that moment I would like make a decision and I'd be like, all right, I'm, I'm staying home. I'm going to sit on the porch with my dog. No work today. Okay, I don't, I don't want work. But... In actuality, coming here and getting to teach you all is like way more fulfilling for me emotionally and it teaches me something and I've learned something from you and now I've had some new ideas and it sparks some thought processes and it like makes me a better person um, than, you know, not working. That there is a, there is sort of an intrinsic benefit to work um, that, that contributing to society um, has an intrinsic benefit above and beyond um, the money that you make, okay? Um, and that, that very well might be true. Um, whether that is, means we shouldn't have a universal basic income, I'm not sure. 
Um, you know, certainly, again, a lot of people, I think, would still choose to work. Um, a lot of people might choose to work at something that they couldn't otherwise afford to work at. We'll see. But um, those are some of the uh, main drawbacks and objections. All right. Last one. Short aside, why is universal in parentheses and not in the resolution at all? So I have been talking about a universal basic income, but you'll notice that the res says basic income. Why is universal in parentheses and not in the resolution? And what, what is the difference between a basic income and a universal basic income? Yeah, so there, we've been talking about a universal basic income, also known as a UBI, but a basic income might not need to go to everyone. So when Joy earlier was talking about Social Security, she's like, I don't know, like, does everyone really need to get Social Security? You could certainly give a basic income and have that basic income be means tested. And so a lot of the, uni the proposals for a universal basic income is like same amount to everybody. But you wouldn't necessarily need to set it up that way. The resolution doesn't require you to set it up that way. It just requires providing a basic income. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, uh, the resolution doesn't require you to have it be universal. Why? By the way, this is, this is, a, this is a harder question. It might require some knowledge of debate a little bit. Um, but what, if you were affirmative and the affirmative proposed a universal basic income, what is a, is a like, very likely objection from the negative? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Not I, I, I do agree with you there, but I'm gonna say I'm gonna say that wasn't what I was thinking of. But yes, you're right. Um yeah, uh yes. Say what? Putting extra money in the market bad. Okay, so cost of inflation, yep, there's a lot of disadvantages. Think along the lines of the universal part. What might be bad about the universal part? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, you it doesn't affect the the gap at all if everyone's getting Okay, so it doesn't affect, doesn't, doesn't close the gap. I like it. What do you think a politician might say? Think about a politician. Yeah. Okay, this is just like a lot, this is like previously, right? Uh, but maybe like, that could really easily run a tick by saying like, make it like non-universal in the sense of like, don't give it to the top 1% of earners and redistribute that to like, the yeah. like So if the affirmative has to propose giving money to everyone equally, the negative could be like, give money to everyone except these people, okay? And, and maybe the, these people are the top 1% of earners. Maybe these people are, you know, uh, people who are disfavored in society for whatever reason. Um, maybe these people are, you know, what, uh, you know, people who are, I don't know, like don't give the, the universal basic income to terrorists. And now we're debating about terrorism and not the plan, okay? So the reason that the resolution says basic income and not universal basic income um, is to prevent the negative from having a bunch of proposals, like annoying proposals that are like, give it to everybody except this person, okay? Give it to everyone except, uh, you know, the founders of Facebook and Amazon, okay? Keep texting them, okay? And then the disadvantage is just like, you know, don't, uh, you know, we want their money. Or give it to everyone except Elon Musk. And then the disadvantage is like, Elon Musk is, you know, uh, annoying and ruining Twitter. And so we like shouldn't, we shouldn't give him money, okay? That would require, that would create a lot of really annoying strategies for the affirmative. And so um, the reason universal is not in resolution, even though most basic income proposals are universal basic income proposals, are to give the affirmative the opportunity to propose a universal basic income, but not require them to make it universal. 